God's people said, amen. You may be seated. Well, church, happy Resurrection Sunday. It is a glorious day to be in the house of God. But if it's been a while, I just want you to know every day we gather with our brothers and sisters of the faith is a glorious day, not just because of this Sunday, because of every day we live, because the promises of who Jesus is and what he's done. If you have your Bible, I want you to turn to Mark chapter 14, starting in verse 43. It says, and immediately while he was still speaking, Judas came, one of the 12, and with him a crowd with swords and clubs from the chief priest and the scribes and the elders. Now the betrayer had given them a sign saying, the one I will kiss is the man. Seize him and lead him away under guard. And when he came, they went up at once. And he said, Rabbi. And he went up and he kissed him. And they laid hands on him and they seized him. But one of those who stood by drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest and cut his ear off. And Jesus said, have you come out against as a robber with swords and clubs to capture me? Day after day, I was with you in the temple teaching you and you did not seize me, but let the scriptures be fulfilled. And they left him and fled. Flipping over to Matthew chapter 26, starting in verse 57. Then those who had seized Jesus led him to Caiaphas, the high priest, and the scribes and the elders gathered and Peter was following him at a distance, as far as the courtyard of the high priest. And going inside, he sat with the guards to see the end. Now the chief priests and the whole council were seeking false testimony of Jesus, and they might put him to death, but they found none. Though many false witnesses came forward, at last two came forward and said, this man said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and rebuild it in three days. And the high priest stood up and said, have you no answer to make? What is it that men testify against you? But Jesus remained silent and the high priest said to him, I adjure you by the living God, tell us if you are the Christ, the son of God. Jesus said to him, you have said so, but I tell you from now on, you will see the son of man seated at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his robes and said, he's uttered blasphemy. What further witnesses do we need? Have you not heard this blasphemy? What is your judgment? They answered, he deserves death. They spit on his face. They struck him. And some slapped him saying, prophesy to us, you Christ, who is it that struck you? And we see here in Luke chapter 22. Luke chapter 22, verse 54. Then they seized him and they led him away, bringing him into the high priest's house. And Peter was falling at a distance. Well, I just read that one. Never mind. Three, I was right. A lot of verses, a lot of tabs. Here we go. John chapter 18. Wait, hold on. I am really confused. First service was much better. <laughs> we got Mark. Then we got Matthew. There we go. Verse 54 of chapter 22. Then he seized him and led him away, the high priest's house, falling a distance. And they kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard and sat down together. Peter sat down among them, a servant girl, seeing him and sat in the light, looking at, closely at him, this man who's also with him, but denied it saying, woman, I do not know him. And a little later, someone else said, you are one of them. But Peter said, man, I am not. And an interval about an hour, still another insisted saying, certainly this man was also for him a Gal Galilean. But Peter said, man, I do not know what you're talking about. And immediately while he was still speaking, a rooster crowed. And the Lord turned and looked at Peter. And Peter remembered the saying of the Lord and how he said to him before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And we see over here in John chapter 18, starting in verse 28. Then they led Jesus from the house of Caiaphas to the governor's headquarters. It was early in the morning. They themselves did not enter the governor's headquarters so that they would be not defiled so they could eat Passover. So Pilate went outside, met with them and said, what accusations do you bring against this man? They answered him, if this man were not doing evil, would he have delivered him to, over to you? Pilate said, take him yourselves and judge him on your own law. The Jews said, it's not lawful for us to put him to death. 
This is to fulfill the word that Jesus had spoken to show by what kind of death he was going to die. Verse 33, so Pilate entered the headquarters again and called Jesus said to him, are you the king of Jews? Jesus answered, do you say this on your own record or in accord or did others say it about me? Pilate answered, am I a Jew? Your own nation, the chief priests have delivered you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting for me that I might be delivered over to the Jews, but my kingdom is not of this world. Then Pilate said to him, so you are a king. Jesus answered, you say that I am king for this purpose. I was born and for this purpose, I have come into the world to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. Pilate said to him, what is truth? After he said this, he went back outside to the Jews and said, I cannot find no guilt in the release of this man. But since this Passover, so do you release to this king of Jews? They cried out again, no, not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a robber. And Luke chapter 23, starting in verse 32. Simon of Cyrene has already been summons to carry the cross of Jesus, picking up verse 32. Two others were criminals, were led away to put to death with him. And when they came to the place that is called the skull, there they crucified him. And the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And they cast lots and divide the garments. And the people stood by watching the rulers and they scoffed at him saying, he saved others, let him save himself. If he's the Christ of God, he is chosen one. So the soldiers also marked him, coming up, offering him wine, saying, if you're the king of Jews, save yourself. And there's also an inscription over him. This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who were hanged railed at him, saying, are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, do, not, do you not fear God since you are under the same condemnation? And that we just needed, we indeed justly, for we are receiving the due reward for our deeds, but this man has done nothing wrong. And he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he said, truly today, you'll be with me in paradise. It was, not, it was now about the sixth hour and there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. While the suns failed and the curtain of the temple was torn in two, then Jesus with a loud voice said, Father, into your hands, I commit my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last breath. And now when the centurion saw what had taken place, he praised God. Certainly this man was innocent. And all the crowds assembled in this spectacle, when they saw what had taken place, they returned home beating their breasts. And when all the acquaintances and the women who had followed from Galilee stood at a distance watching these things. Now there was a man named Joseph from the Jewish town of Arimathea. He was a member of the council of good righteous men who had not consented to the decision and action that he was looking for in the kingdom of God. This man went to Pilate and he asked for the body of Jesus and he took it down wrapped in a linen shroud and laid him in the tomb and a cut stone where there was no one ever been laid. It was the day of preparation and the Sabbath was beginning. The women who had come with him from Galilee followed and saw the tomb and his body laid and they returned and prepared spices and ointments. On the Sabbath, they rested according to the commandment. Chapter 24. But on the first day of the week at early dawn, they went to the tomb taking spice they had prepared. And they found the stone rolled away in the tomb. When they went, they did not find the body of Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by them, dazzling apparel. They were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground. The men said to them, why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but he is risen. Remember how he told you while he was in Galilee that the son of man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and crucified and on the third day rise. And they remembered his words and returning from the tomb, they told all the things to the 11 and all the rest. Now it was Mary Magdalene, Joanna and Mary, the mother of James and the other women who told these things to the apostles. But these words seemed to them an idle tale and they did not believe them. But Peter rose and ran to the tomb, stooping and looking in, saw the linen cloths by themselves, and he went home marveling at what had happened. Now you say, Pastor, why did you just spend the first 10 minutes of your entire message just reading the scripture? 
couldn't we read that like before we came to church or maybe we had already read this, read this, you know, this weekend and you're just regurgitating this. Uh, there's two reasons why I did that. One is the scriptures will always speak clearer than man. There's nothing more important to coming in here today and gathering around God's word, not what man thinks of God's word. Two is I think it's helpful to us to remind us of what the scriptures say versus tradition. Did you know nowhere in the scriptures does it mention the words cat of nine tails? Yet most of us grew up in church always hearing how Jesus was whipped with a cat of nine tails. Nowhere in the scriptures does it account. It says he was beaten, he was flogged. Not that he wasn't probably beaten with a cat of nine tails. If we were to go into uh, Roman history and figure out how uh, executions and those kinds of things were done, we would probably see that happen. But we, sometimes we take tradition and we just kind of force it into the scriptures as if it's what really happened. But we don't see anywhere in the scriptures of Jesus being beat with a cat of nine tails. Most likely could have been, but the scriptures doesn't, don't teach that. Second thing, the other reason is Jesus, the record, scriptures never record Jesus falling under the weight of the cross. Although we've seen it demonstrated most of the time. As a matter of fact, there are churches who gathered this weekend to go through the, the seven stages or the three stages of Jesus falling under the weight of the cross. But the reality is I wanna know, is it three or is it seven? Because the scripture do not indicate Jesus ever falling under the weight of the cross. And I know some of you are thinking, pastor, I've, I've heard that growing up my entire life. You probably have, but it's not in the scripture, didn't probably, it probably happened. I can imagine Jesus after being beat and flogged and being stood up all night long and going through a false trial and all those things that yes, absolutely probably fail. But the thing is sometimes we insert tradition into the scripture and say, oh, the Bible says, and it doesn't actually say it. Church, fellow brothers and sisters in Christ, it is important that we find ourselves in the word of God, not around a man who teaches the word of God. Nothing wrong with going to church. There's nothing wrong with listening to a good pastor or following someone online or attending a church where you feel like, you know, the guy's encouraging. But we as ourselves, as followers of Jesus, owe it to our own walk with Jesus to know the scriptures. So that's why... I hope you didn't feel like we wasted your time for 11 minutes while we read through the scriptures because in that is actually what brings life. In there is what actually is truth. Now, last week we talked about how Jesus rode in as a king, fulfilling the prophecy of Zechariah 9.9. 9, and we said today we talked about how he was run out as a criminal. So what happened in the midst of this, this week ordeal where Jesus was declared Hosanna in the highest and palm branches were laid down. And people were excited that the prophecy was fulfilled that a king would come riding in on a donkey. What happened in the midst of him teaching in the synagogues and healing the people that now they're crying out, give us Barabbas instead of let Jesus free? Well, while we can speculate on and on and on, we just really come to grips with the fact that we must caution ourselves that we do the same thing. We do the same thing. There have been times in our life we, we welcome Jesus in. We, you know, we, we go through a situation where like, we just need to pray about this. We need to pray about this. And the moment whatever this is seems to be kind of back on track, we're done. We're back to our life without Jesus again. Once the marriage just seems to kind of be on, on, on rocky ends, things, we kind of reach out to Jesus and we cry out to him, we claim him as king of our life and control of everything. And when life seems to kind of get back to what we would dictate as normal, we put Jesus back off the side. So there are times when we welcome him as king and then other times we've kind of dismissed him and put him off. Many of us have, at one point, maybe recognized Jesus as Savior. But we've rejected him and the calling to live when that calling becomes hard to live. Or when it didn't turn out the way we wanted and, and, and the, what we were praying for, God didn't do it our way. And so we reject him, we move him on and we cast him out just like the Jews did a criminal. 
There are times in our life we've welcomed him and there are other times we've rejected when he didn't do it the way we thought or the way we prayed. And we've rejected him as well. Sure, we all wanna go to heaven. Who does it? I mean, explain to any kid, you know, hey, this is what hell looks like. Do you wanna be there? Or do you wanna go to a place where things are so great that they use gold as asphalt? Well, yeah, sounds like a place I wanna be at. And so many of us say we wanna go to heaven, but we don't wanna give up our weekends or our weeknights. We wanna save those for us because that's my time. We don't wanna give of ourselves or our possessions unless we're actually cleaning out our closet because it's just time to get rid of some old stuff that we don't need anymore so we can go help someone who's less fortunate. And we gather up the bags and we gather up the family and we take a picture and we put it on Instagram. Look at us doing this good deed, serving our community. And can't we just give of ourselves instead of the stuff that we don't want anymore? When we take in things for the church, people are like, well, we were gonna get a new living room set. We'll just give the church the old one. Can I just tell you, they never outfitted the tabernacle with what came out of the people's homes. They made new, they brought it in. God requires us of our best. He requires sacrifice of our lives. And it's easy to kind of welcome in when we feel like everything should go our way and we kind of reject them when things aren't going our way, just like we saw what the Jews did. The good thing is Jesus isn't determined by what we say about him. Whether they cried out Hosanna or they cried out, give us Barabbas, Jesus isn't defined by what the crowd said. He's defined by who he is. So therefore, Jesus rode in as the king that day because he was the king of kings. He rose from the grave because he was the king of kings. He was the Lord of lords. He was the savior of the earth. And you say, Paul, why are you saying the past sin? Many of us live that way. It's something that Jesus did, but not something he's doing. Church, we should not think of Jesus was being the king of kings. He is and still is and will be forevermore the King of kings, the Lord of lords, and the Savior of the world. We should not be living as something that Jesus did past since, but what he's doing right now in our lives. Sure, it's easy to want to cling to a God who gives you hope in the future. And we claim those promises, but we also realize that he's in the refining process too. And we should consider it pure joy when we go through trials of many kinds. Those are not the promises we like to claim at different times. The thing is, is I'm not asking you today if you acknowledge if Jesus is king or Jesus is God. I'm not asking you to acknowledge those things because the scripture tells us in James 2.19 that the demons believe that and they shudder. Many of us would acknowledge that and we flaunt our sin even more. We will post it. We will laugh about it. We'll talk about it. We'll share. We'll invite others to participate. Should it not concern us that demons, when they hear the name of Jesus, they shudder, they tremble, and we let it roll off our tongue in a point of profanity? We were made in the image of him. We should be image bearers of him. Yes, some of us believe in God and sometimes we seem to have zero remorse for our sinful ways. But we need to realize that that sin is what separated us from God. That sin is what hung him on Calvary's tree. There's nothing that you can do or I can do that can fix any of that. See, Romans 3.23 tells us that everyone here has sin and falling short of God's glory. God's standard of perfection. Every one of us in those moments have messed up. I don't care how good you thought last week was, there was a point in time that you probably said something, thought something, reacted in a way that was contrary to the perfection and the holiness of who God is. Everyone of us, myself included. 
Matter of fact, Romans 6, 23 tells us this, that the wages of sin is death. The free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. That there's a punishment, that death, and when you see death in the scripture, it means separation from God. Because of everyone, have saw, everyone has sinned, that sin separates us, but there's a free gift through Christ Jesus our Lord. And I love this next one, Romans 5, 8. It says, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. I've heard so many people tell me, say, well, Pastor, when I get my life back squared up and I get kind of back on track, then I'm gonna, kind of, I'm gonna get back in church and I'm gonna get back to doing things you know, for God. I'm gonna, I'm gonna kind of get back on track. Can I just tell you, you will never be able to get back on track on your own. God says, while you were still, in the, while you were still doing what you're doing, before you even knew all these things, I'm gonna, I died for you. That's how much I love for you. I chose to forgive you before you had the chance to even ask me to forgive you. That's how much I love you. While you were still a sinner, Christ died for us. Romans 10, nine through 10 tells us this. But if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is the Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. It says, for the heart, one believes and is justified. With the mouth, one confesses and saved. This is as close as you'll ever get to a sinner's prayer that's found in the Bible. I confess with my mouth that you are Lord. I believe in my heart that God raised you from the dead. That's the closest we'll ever get to the sinner's prayer. The other thing is Romans 10, 13, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Church, is there a point in time where you can look back and say, this is when I made the decision to follow Jesus. Last week, we talked about how there's no such thing as common law salvation. You know, in Texas, there's common law marriage. I mean, you, you, you live together, you're being together, you declare yourself husband or wife in front of, you know, two or three more people over a period of time, then you can be legally married. But there's no thing the Bible tells you if you go to church six weeks in a row, now you're a Christian. Or if you went to VBS and now you serve in VBS, now you're a Christian. Does it happen? It's only a place where you confess who Jesus is. My question is, have you done that? Have you personally made the decision to follow Jesus? People have asked me this question. They're saying, when we're talking about salvation and God and heaven and hell, I've been asked the question to say, why would God, a loving God, send someone to hell? See, the better question is this, how could anyone reject a loving God? It's not that God sends people to hell, it's not the fact that people reject a loving and holy God. Those of you who are following Jesus today, those who would say, I am a Christ bearer, I walk with Jesus, he saved me the soul, the Holy Spirit lives in my life. Can I just ask you a question? Are you telling other people about what you would say is the greatest thing that happened in your life? When was the last conversation you had with someone who said, here's who Jesus is and this is what he's done in my life. Come and see how he's worked in my marriage. Come and see how he's worked in the relationship with my kids. When was the last time you invited someone to participate in what the Jesus Christ, the savior of the world has done in your life? When have you invited someone to be a part of that? If you're here today, and you don't know who Jesus is at the very end of the service, I'll be down here along with some of our deacons. We'd love to talk with you. Maybe you're going through a very difficult time and you just need some guidance, some prayer. Again, we'll be down here at the front or maybe you're ready to tell someone about what God is doing and you just can't wait. Just know that we can't wait to hear about it either. We we'll invite us all, let's stand to our feet and let's sing as we close this Resurrection Sunday. Come and see. Come and see what God has done. So come and see what God has done. It's all sweet, all enough. And let the sound of praise be heard. Shout for joy.
church home we would love for you to come back next week if there's anything we can pray for you about please come forward let us talk with you jesus has done some great things in our lives let us not be silent about that this week he's died he's risen let's go tell others and tell them to come and see the work that jesus done in my life you're dismissed have a wonderful resurrection sunday